Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another installment of SU-25, the DCS Gateway Drug. In the last installment, we looked at a wide range of unguided rockets that are available to the SU-25. Today we're going to take a look at the guided rockets, or missiles I guess I should say, that are available for the SU-25. Um, I have to say that this episode caused me some trouble while I was making it, and the fundamental issue is that while these weapons work, more or less as intended, it appears, they don't really work that well on the SU-25. I don't mean to say that they perform poorly, uh, more that the SU-25 as a platform is just not that well adapted to make use of them. So, well, let me explain that. The weapons that are provided for the SU-25 in the game are basically what I would call the um, early second generation version of guided weapons. So, I'm no expert on the subject, and if someone as a greater command of the history of this topic, please feel free to add some comments, but basically the development of guided weapons seems to have gone something like this. Uh, ever since we started dropping weapons from airplanes and trying to hit targets, the quest has been on to effectively deliver them more accurately from farther away, which would seem like a fairly obvious objective since achieving those objectives simultaneously gives you more damage and less effort and less danger. So, to increase the accuracy, many things have been tried, but they basically boil down to two approaches. One, improve the predictability of the delivery and allow them for more accurate aiming. And two, steer the weapon once it leaves the aircraft and make sure it hits the target. If you want to know more about the first subject, have a look at my series called The Iron Bomber's Guide to the DCS Galaxy. For the second approach, the first attempts at providing terminal guidance to an airdrop munition that I know of was actually a glide bomb developed by the Germans in World War II called the Fritz X, which was used against Allied warships with some success during the invasion of Sicily. The guidance system was pretty simple. The bomb had a flare in its tail that the bombardier in the dropping aircraft could see, and he would simply guide the bomb to the target by watching the flare and the target and making them coincide. This was the same guidance system that was used in the first U.S. Uh, true air-to-ground guided missile, the U.S. Bullpup, which entered service with the U.S. Navy in 1959. Used basically the same system where the uh, weapon system operator or the pilot watched the missile, watched the target, and guided the missile to the target. But it also required the aircraft to basically fly after the missile, after it had dropped it, and be able to see the target for the whole time, which uh, had its limitations, including on the survivability of the dropping aircraft. So, as you can see, we've worked our way almost all the way out to the iron bombing range here. It's coming up to the front right of the aircraft. We're going to use a slightly different pattern today. Instead of flying over the targets and coming around, we're going to fly in front of them and go around because we're going to be firing at a bit longer standoff distance. The um, pattern we're going to use today is we're going to fire the first couple of rockets at the big target just to get our aiming procedure down, and then after that we're going to fire the rockets at the smaller targets. Uh, the idea being, again, to see whether or not uh, in a 25-meter area they have any kind of lethality against soft skin vehicles. Okay, so while we're getting lined up, let's continue talking about the history of guided missiles. The experience with uh, the bullpup uh, convinced developers that it was not really the best way to guide missiles to the target. So the hunt was on after that for a uh, more practical form of guidance. The first of this uh, was an electro-optical system that the U.S. developed for its... Uh, walleye guided bomb and subsequently applied to the Maverick missile. And this was um, essentially taking a video signal designating a target in it and then the missile would remember that uh, target in the video signal and would fly itself toward it. Um, as I said, this was the first guidance system that was used by the Maverick missile. Of course, the Maverick has now implemented multiple different kinds of guidance, including um, uh, infrared guidance and, of course, semi-active laser homing. Now, semi-active laser homing is the kind of guidance we want to talk about today because it's what both of the missiles that we're going to use today use. So, speaking of which, uh, let's try and use those missiles. The first up will be the KH-25. As you can see, I've got my laser on, and I've got my laser designator up. It's not moving. I'm trying to put it over the target. I'm not having much luck. I've got a launch... I've got a launch light, but I really don't have the designated where I want it to be. So uh, we're going to have to go around and try that again. Well, 
Okay, while we're doing that, let's talk a little bit about the theory of how it's supposed to work when it does. With a semi-active laser-guided missile, uh, a laser designator is used, either the designator on the dropping aircraft or on a buddy aircraft or even on a ground unit, and the reflected laser light is picked up by the missile, and the missile essentially rides the beam down to the target so long as the start target stays illuminated. So if the illumination is not being provided by the dropping aircraft, this becomes a fire and forget system, but uh, in the case where the aircraft has to do its own illumination, then the aircraft still has to maintain designation on the target until the missile hits it. Which brings us finally by a roundabout route to the missiles that we're going to be sampling today. As far as Soviet guided munitions go, the first to enter service was the KH-23, which entered service in the late 1960s and was similar to the bullpup, uh, requiring optical guidance all the way to the target. The next generation of Soviet missile, the KH-25, basically took the same system and replaced the guidance with semi-active laser homing, and that's the first missile we'll be firing today. Okay, so we're coming around on the target again. Now we're not too high. Again, we're using a fairly shallow approach, but we're a good ways out. So now I'm going to take my laser designator, which is on. I'm going to move the cursor over the target, and then I'm going to lock it to the target to confirm the designation. And then once it's confirmed, uh, we'll wait for the range rings to coincide, get a launch light, fire the missile. Now we just have to keep the laser designator on the target until the missile hits. And there it is, and now we can turn away, and while we're going around again, let's talk a little bit more about the weapons we are going to be using today. The KH-25 Karen, as NATO calls it, entered service in 1975. It's uh, similar to the early model Mavericks in terms of payload, weighing in at 300 kilograms and delivering a payload of around 100. It's a bit shorter range than the Maverick, with a maximum range of around 11 kilometers. The second missile that we'll be deploying today is the much larger KH-29, or Kedge, which debuted in 1980. Specifically, we'll be using the KH-29L, which uses exactly the same seeker as the KH-25, and has approximately the same range, but weighs in at more than double the weight, at 660 kilograms, and delivers a warhead of around 320 kilograms, which puts it somewhere between a Mark 83 and a Mark 84 bomb. Now, the KH-29 comes with a variety of seeker heads, including infrared, radar, and electro-optical, but only the laser-guided version of the missile is available for the SU-25 base model. When we look at the T model, we'll see some of the other options. All right, so here we are coming around again. We got the laser uh, designator uh, cursor up. the laser on. We're just trying to get the cursor over the center of the target. And once we're in range, and just move it around, get it locked there, and when we're in range, we fire the missile. And this time it lofted a little bit. That's interesting. And there you go. Good hit. And we pull away again uh, before we get over the target. Now, the thing that I found with the SU-25, at least in my setup, I have a, a Thrustmaster Warthog joystick, is uh, the cursor uh, movement was, was pretty finicky. Um, and especially at that range, I found that uh, getting the cursor on the target was really a combination of pointing the nose at the right spot, as well as maybe making some fine adjustments. But, but really, uh, it was really pretty hard to get a very precise location uh, for the cursor because um, there's no magnification so um, you know uh, I kind of experimented as I was going along and I found that basically trying to get a pretty good aim with the nose uh, and then maybe some fine adjustments with the cursor was the way to go. Okay for the third run with the KH-25 let's uh, line up on the uh, first small target and see if uh, aiming at that um, delivers any kind of lethal effect to the vehicles that are around it. Now these are soft skin, soft skin vehicles, but they are 25 meters uh, around the circle, so I'm not really expecting a whole lot of effect from a Maverick-sized missile, but um, worth just seeing how it does anyways. 
as an interesting effect where I have to get DCS convinced to draw the targets before I can line up on them. There we go. Still managing a pretty good standoff though, and there we see the missile lofting again. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, this is a precision guided muni munition, but that was not a very precise launch. Uh, but it really was about as good as I could do from that range with an optical sight. Right, so I think that fairly uh, conclusively demonstrates what I consider to be the basic limitation of using these kinds of weapons on the SU-25, at least the base bomb. They were effectively designed after the airframe that we're hanging them on, and that is what really limits their effectiveness. Because although they can make use of the laser designator on the SU-25, the plane itself has no sighting aids, and that means that although the missile will guide accurately to the designated spot, the precision of that spot is seriously limited by A, the pilot's ability to see the target, and B, the ability to accurately lay the laser marker on it. Now, these limitations are overcome in other aircraft, and in the T version of the SU-25, by providing uh, some kind of optical sight with magnification and a more accurate uh, laser uh, designation cursor, uh, but we don't have those in the base model. So here we're coming around again with our last KH-25 given another run. So once again I'm going to try and aim at the middle of that first target, see if we can put something down in the middle of those vehicles. So trying to get it lined up with the nose and wait for the target to show up in DCS. Okay, and then try and get it on there accurately. Fiddle around a little bit to get a little bit more time. Trying to get a better mark than I did last time. Okay, and there we go. And again, we have to fly at least towards the target until the missile hits, and this time, okay, better accuracy, but uh, not surprisingly, we didn't seem to do any damage to any of the targets that were around. So, uh, let's go around and try it with the big boys and uh, see if we have any more luck uh, taking anything out with the KH-29. Okay, so we're coming around again. So, of course, you know, the other problem with uh, it being difficult to, to lay the laser on the target is that the whole time you're doing that, you're giving up standoff distance, of course. Uh, you know, in the last round, we, we got a um, round more in the center of the target, but, um, you know, we launched it at quite a bit closer because we spent so much time trying to get it lined up. So it's a bit of a trade-off that way, too. So here we go with the KH-29 getting rolled in. Got to wait for DCS to draw us the targets. And it would probably help if I turned my laser on. Let's get that on. There we go. Find the middle of the target and launch. Now, the launch sequence for the KH-29 is pretty cool where it drops and then ignites the rocket engine after it has. Once again, got to fly towards the target. And once again, we hit long. Now, we did take out a vehicle that we came close to. Uh, but we weren't really in the middle of the target again. So, got one more rocket. Let's uh, go around one more time and see what we can do. There's a little bit of an asymmetric load when we do this, especially with something as large as a KH-29. So one thing I will say is you'll notice that I'm not using the S25s, which are also come in a guided rocket uh, variant. Uh, some people have said that they have a lot of luck with the S25Ls. Uh, I wasn't actually able to get them to work consistently for this video. I just could not get them to launch uh, and lock on uh, consistently. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. Don't know what I was doing wrong, uh, but I just decided not to put them in this video because uh, it just wasn't worth it. Uh, for you guys to watch me fumbling around trying to get them to work.
They're much closer range, though, I will say, than either of the true guided missile types. Um, they don't really improve their range at all with the guided version, so they're, they're closer to two kilometers rather than six. And there we go. And a good lock. And a nice launch. All right, that was more in the middle. Looks like we did a little bit more damage to a couple of vehicles as well. So even at 25 meters, um, you know, that missile is capable of doing some damage to soft skin vehicles. Around here and um, come back in, take a little bit of a low pass, take a look at the damage more up close and personal. Um, I think the basic conclusion I come to from this video um, is that these weapons are really just not very well suited to the platform. Um, the SU-25 just doesn't have a sighting system that allows it to get the most out of these weapons. They can be very precise, but you just can't aim them precisely with the system that the SU-25 has unless you're so close to the target that it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference uh, to using them. You could be using unguided rockets with just about as much effect. So. I just don't think these weapons are particularly well adapted to this platform, and that's uh, that's my main conclusion from trying to use them this way. I'm looking forward to doing the video with the SU-25T, where we have a bit more of an appropriate uh, sighting mechanism, and then maybe we can get more out of these weapons. There we go. So we did do some damage. Uh, so that KH-29 is definitely a fearsome weapon. And I think uh, if we could guide it properly, it would really be something uh, that we could uh, use quite effectively. But it, uh, it just doesn't work very well with the SU-25. I mean, if you want more uh, proof that, of that, uh, the SU-25 had these weapons available when it was used in Afghanistan. And uh, although they did use some of the laser-guided uh, munitions, they only ever used them when they were designated uh, from the ground rather than... Uh, from the air because I, I suspect they found exactly the same kind of limitations we've been talking about today. There's a quick look in the F-10 display. So we did do a fair bit of damage with that one KH-29. Uh, so one other interesting announcement uh, that I wanted to let you guys know about. This is the first mission that I actually flew uh, in VR, although uh, obviously the you can't tell from watching the video. But I will be doing some content on how I'm finding flying in VR. It's definitely a different experience. If you want to see that or any more of this series, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and like the videos. It helps keep them coming. But for now, this is going to be Sidekick, signing off.